Well, hi, everyone. I'm Gary Berman, the host of the Cyber Hero Adventure Show. Thank you so much for being with us uh, here today. And uh, based on that super cool introduction, uh, how disappointed are you to just see me sitting here? Well, don't worry. It's going to be an incredibly exciting show because I can show you why I, 60, a 63-year-old man had to go to the dry cleaners to pick up a superhero costume. So you'll have to stay tuned for that. Uh, in the meantime, we have an incredibly, incredibly interesting guest today. Uh, John Kinderbog. How you doing, John? I'm doing great, Gary. Thanks for having me on today. I appreciate it. Did you laugh at my little dry cleaner thing yet or not? Yeah, uh, well, yeah, no, sure. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I laughed at the idea of a 63 year old man having a superhero costume. So that's kind of concerning. But uh, if your wife <laughs> wants to talk, you know, I, I, uh, I only charge five cents uh, for psychoanalysis like Lucy. So Oh, uh, listen, well, you get you get what you pay for. So, That's true. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. right back at you, by the way. Look, yeah. um, I, I, I've come to understand that you're quite a complex person yourself, you know, not unlike layers of an onion. Is that is that true? I don't know that I'm I, I don't think I'm that complex, but who knows? So. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, so here, here's here's part of the reason, you know, that I that I uh, I say that, um, you know, one of the, the missions besides shining the light on the unsung cyber heroes who toil in anonymity to keep us safe like you is to, you know, I use this sort of uh, analogy of an aircraft carrier that the cybersecurity and IT community is this big, you know, giant thing moving slowly like this, but all this kinetic <laughs> all the planes and everything going around, you know, crazy. And I, you know, I'm hoping that uh, our effort contributes to kind of pivoting the industry from, you know, fear, uncertainty and, and doubt, which, you know, there's plenty to be afraid of and uncertain amount of doubtful, uh, that's for sure, to, to fun. So, you know, we've been able to, you know, sort of understand, but what I want to do is to understand what people think is fun for them and, and how they unleash joy. And I can tell you right off the bat that I have a man crush on you because of <laughs> this. Now, you know, you know that we create uh, superhero comics right. and, you know, I, I happen to see this on, I think it was your Twitter. Uh, it's my Twitter avatar. Yeah. All right. So what's the origin story of that avatar? So that avatar comes from the uh, comic book series, graphic novels, uh, called Sinja, C-Y-N-J-A. Uh, so Sinja was a, a, a series of books created by good friends of mine, Heather Dahl, who's over at Indico Tech, and Chase Cunningham, who just left Forrester. He took my old job at Forrester, and now he's over at Earcom. And uh, they created a comic book series really to help uh, kids learn to read in a fun way, kids who were into video games and stuff like that. So that was the original concept. They wrote three of those. I think they were ahead of the game, you know, in, in understanding how to do that. So, uh, but you can get on my, on Amazon and they're, they're, I mean, I, I was just texting with Heather this morning, great people doing great stuff in the cyber world. Heather is reinventing uh, uh, identity. Chase is working on zero trust concepts around things like browser isolation and other stuff. So, you know, great people, but, but, uh, they had this, I mean, there's stuff that if you've been in this business for a long time, you can learn about that. You know, um, uh, John, John Postel is a character in the first one. Um, Rob wow. Jaffe is a character. And, uh, so it's really inspired by the early days of the internet and, uh, helping kids understand, good and bad behavior on the internet and in life and teaching them to read and just a really, really uh, incredible series of, uh, of books. So, Well, that's what I think about that. And, you know, uh, what I would love to do is to have Chase on the show. Can you, can you do that? It'd be great. Well, you got to have Chase and Heather together. They're a pair, right? They're let's, the, let's do it. Done. Yeah, well, I'll see what I can do. Maybe they're listening. So uh, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, you know, look, our whole thing is a rising tide lifts all ships, you know, yeah. and and we try to do things, you know, in a little bit more of a fun way while still having substance. And evidently, you know, one of our audience is attempting to be funny, I think. Ah. <laughs> you know, you, you, you really don't know with with uh, with deep, all this deep fakes. deep fakes, man, it's crazy. I was just talking to uh Renee Murphy, an analyst at Forrester, an old friend of mine, uh, about deep, deep fakes and and what are the like deep fakes 
we think about that as changing the idea of, of what, what's going to happen to, you know, these concept of, of identity, but how do you deal with copyright issues? Right. And who, do we need any more movie stars? I mean, we'll just put John Wayne or Henry Belafonte in every movie, you know, or whoever, Catherine Hepburn comes back and Hollywood is going to take advantage of that. And how does copyright work? I mean, technology leads to all these unintended consequences, uh, both, you know, good and bad. And so then how do we know that, that on the video conference, it's not, it's this CEO talking to me and not some malicious actor. I mean, these are questions that we don't a have answers for yet. You know, it's interesting you say that because uh, recently I had a subject matter expert on about deep fakes specifically. And one of the things to me that was just kind of my mind, many things were mind blowing, like what you're saying now, but there was another level to it. It's like, how do you, how do you detect a deep fake? And so one of the things that they look for through artificial intelligence is the eyes, you know, and the way the eyes blink. And there's something about the cornea, you know, the way it reflects light or something like that. And, and so they developed this technology, but then the, the bad guys, the criminals already have a fix to that ability to check, check deep fakes. I mean, like, what is this? Well, it's adversarial, right? I mean, and it's bi-directional. So I, I worked with a, a guy um, named Jason Ostrom to create VoIP, the VoIP hopper tool and do VoIP hacking. And, uh, and the, the main voice over IP vendor that we were hacking at the time created technology to stop us. He called us the VoIP hacking clowns in his blog post. And wow. like the next day, uh, Jason re-engineered the program to get around that. Right. So you're never, it, it, there's, it's never stasis. It's always moving. Right. And, uh, and our adversaries are, are, you know, spinning all around our aircraft carrier and they can move faster than we can move. And a lot of times we don't see them because, you know, we don't, we, we're, A, we're not looking in the right place. It's so big. We don't have enough people to look and B, um, they're just really stealthy and they're good at their job. Sometimes these things come up and I just want to give them a hand. Wow. That was really awesome. You know, wow. from a technological standpoint. So yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, and also, you know, it, it seems to, and let me just check with you to see if what I'm about to share is, is valid that, you know, it seems to me that in the criminal you know world, um, that they are kind of horizontally organized and they share information really, you know, quite freely, you know, with one another. But, you know, the defenders uh, making a very general statement are much more vertically structured because of uh, competition, intellectual property, laws and rules and regulations. But it's getting a lot better than than it was. That's what like the ISACs. I love the ISACs. What, what is that valid? I mean, this horizontal and vertical sort of thing? Or? Well, I think it's I don't know that that's the real problem because we do share a lot of information. I mean, we both know Rick Howard, right? And he created the uh, Cyber Threat Alliance. And so the Th Cyber Th Threat Alliance um, shares that threat data freely amongst anybody. And so it's not that problem. The problem, I'll, I'll tell you, the real problem is change management, right? Uh, oh, that's interesting. Hackers don't have change management, Gary. They don't call up and say, hey, I just tried to hack uh, Gary and it didn't work. When's my next hacking window? Oh, right. uh, three weeks uh, uh, from today on Sunday at 2 a.m. Uh, on the same day as my daughter's birthday. I mean, right. right? They don't do right. that. But that's right. how we manage change. Hmm. You know, I mean, uh, you have those change management windows. They're always in the middle of the night. Uh, they're always on a holiday because we think our people aren't going to use it. And by the time we've made the change to a system, I mean, the, the hackers are gone, right? It would be like, uh, we're going to call the cops three weeks after somebody has stole something from our house. For real. Yeah. I mean, that is, um, you know, really kind of painful, isn't it? You know, I, and, <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I, I think, I think that uh, some of these structural sort of challenges just have to evolve you know, uh, going forward or, you know, is this a, here's a rhetorical sort of question that you're great to you know, hear from you on. Can we like win this battle or is it just never going to stop? Well, so those are two different questions. Okay. Right. Can we yep. win the battle? Yeah, we can win the battle against cyber actors stealing the things that, that they can monetize or that get us in trouble. 
but it will never stop at the same time. So, uh, so yeah, both yeah. those things are, are, are true. We can win it. I do a presentation called win the cyber war with zero trust about how you win it by doing little things incrementally and iteratively uh, and uh, around using zero trust concepts, but it's always going to be around. And uh, so we're never going to like put them out of business. We're never going to make everything so secure that the cyber criminals can't act, right. especially now that nation states are involved. Right. Yeah, so yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, but we often have these, these ideas of, of what we're doing from the, from television. And so I oh. talked to too many people who watch too much TV and in order to make, I mean, cybercrime is really boring at some level. I mean, cybersecurity is really boring. It's, it's almost 100% somebody looking at a screen or something happening on a computer that doesn't even have a screen, right? There's nothing. It's not like regular crime where there's cops that pull out weapons and chase bad guys. I mean, that stuff rarely happens. Well, so well hold, on, hold on. Let me excuse the interruption because, you know, I want to show you our attempt to answer that exact question. Okay, yeah. Uh, so that's uh, Ivan the Identity Thief. You know that that uh, you know basically is trying to you know combat what you just said. Here's here's Wilbur Wannacry, um, you know, and and uh, and here's uh, Vernon the Virus, uh, all of which are based on real life things with the mission of basically making what you're talking about exciting and entertaining and engaging and cool. You know well, no, I get that, but that's not again, that's not real life. Right. And so real, the real life stuff is pretty boring. Hmm. And and so we can't, you know, equate how we're going to how we're going to make it more exciting with what how, what happens in real life. I mean, I remember walking, walking to a, a session that I was speaking at in, uh, I think, Oklahoma City with one of the Secret Service's top um, executives. And we were lamenting that, boy, if only we had the tools in real life that they always show on TV. Right? Oh, interesting. I mean, you know, find that clip from uh, NCIS with uh, the, the, the two people typing at the same time to hack into a system. I mean, it's a great example of how clueless they are. You know, how would that overdrive the keyboard buffer if two people were trying to type two different things at the same time? But that's how people see it. You know, I hear that all the time. Well, I saw this on NCIS. I saw this on Mr. Robot. I saw this on whatever. Wow. And and oftentimes the answer is simple. I remember watching an episode of 24 and, oh, the worm is coming through. It's getting through the routers. We can't <laughs> stop it. And I'm yelling at the TV, unplug it. Just unplug it. Right? <laughs> unplug it. We can't stop it. Oh, no, it's so good that we're it's getting around all of our controls. And I'm like, unplug the dang thing. It doesn't run without oh. power, right? God, so there's times when you should just unplug, right? There's been big hacks where I know in the background, somebody was saying, we just need to unplug this whole thing. And the business was saying, no, 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 we, 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 we can't do that. Right, right. right. Because we'll lose money. I mean, uh, I, on 9-11, right? If we remember 9-11. Yeah, sure. Uh, when the plane, the first plane flew into the the first tower the head of dispatch for american airlines shut down all american airlines flights if you were in um yeah if, if you were flying you were told to land to the nearest divert airport if you were on the the taxiway the, the runway uh if you were at the gate you were banned from taking off and the executives right. were running in and saying no 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 you have to let them go because we're going to lose all this money do wow. you know how much this is going to cost us if, if we don't get these planes off the ground? And he's yelling back, something's going on. We're going to shut this whole thing down until we know what's happening. And and they were like, we're going to fire you. And he was, I'm in the union. You can't fire me. And ultimately, he got a little uh, citation from the president because once he started shutting everything down, then everything shut down. And what we'll never know, at least publicly, is how many lives were saved because he did that thing. He just unplugged. Wow, that, that's an incredibly, um, you know, significant and relevant, uh, you know, analogy. And thanks for sharing that. Wow, that's just unbelievable. <sighs> well, I, I just needed to take a breath after hearing that. I mean, you know, so um, so speaking of uh, taking a breath, I'm going to introduce uh, uh, someone who's uh, really just an incredible friend of the show and and a really really uh, smart guy. This is Ron Craig. Hey, Ron. Hey, Gary. Hey, John. How you doing? Hey, Ron. Good hey, to see you again. 
I don't usually get called a smart guy. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I slipped Gary about twenty bucks earlier. And just yeah. Well, uh, uh, this is a bit of a comedy show, so don't worry. <laughs> anyway, sorry. no, it's um, awesome. I'm glad I'm happy to be here, and uh, especially to you know share a stage with John. You know, especially you know with uh, everything that you do, have done, and been part of. You know, so it's always it's definitely a privilege, and has been a privilege to be here with you as well, Gary. And I always appreciate you inviting me to. Uh, to participate in these shows. And uh, I love the topic, you know, zero trust. Uh, you know, I, I said many times over the, <laughs> over the years, it's not, you know, it's not just a, a marketing term or a thing. It's, it's really a way of life. It's a way, it's a shift in mindset. You know, it's, we got to think differently and we got the guy on here leading the charge to uh, get everybody to think differently. Indeed. Um, and so to that end, John, uh, maybe now's a good time to kind of jump in. Uh, let me uh, pop up uh, one of your great uh, illustrations, graphics here, um, and uh, see if you can just kind of riff on, on what we're looking at here. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, this is from the new company I just joined onto it. And, and what we're talking about is how do we build zero trust environments. What does zero trust mean? So zero trust is just the elimination of trust because trust is a human emotion that we've injected into digital systems for no reason at all. And ultimately, the root cause of every data breach or probably every significant uh, cyber event is trust. You know, you think it's a phishing attack, but it exploits the trust model. You think it's uh, a ransomware attack, but it definitely exploits the trust model. So this flawed, broken trust model that got injected into the system where some parts of the network are trusted and some are untrusted, those things were arbitrary, no reason to have them. And uh, I just, you know, I started by saying we have to change this and, and just eliminate trust. So the first rule of zero trust, uh, or no, nah, that's not the first rule. The first rule of zero trust is you don't talk about zero trust. It's the same thing as Fight Club, which is why you don't see a lot of case studies, right? Uh, wait, because... wait, 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 hold on. Hold on. So, forgive me for a minute. Can we, can we just help me understand that better? Like why, yeah. why would you not talk about it? Because your legal or PR team doesn't want you to talk about it. So they, when I say, hey, you want to do a session on zero trust or a case study on zero trust and what you're doing? Yeah, I do. I want to tell the world on that. I want to, I want to articulate how valuable this is. And then the legal and PR team and, and, and those kinds of folks, the suits or whatever you want to call them, come in and say, no, no, you can't do that. That'll put a target on our back, right? Wow. And, huh. and when I talk to people, you know, who, who know these things they say yeah no it actually doesn't put a target on your back uh it actually takes the target off because that's that's what i get from what you said yeah but, attackers don't attack well-defended networks right? Right, right but uh because there's no money in it i mean this is yeah. all about making money but in in the mind of legal people hr people um uh pr people yeah, no, we don't want to tell them that. So that's been the hardest struggle of zero trust. And that's why I say zero trust is like Fight Club. The first rule is you don't talk about it, right? There's a big there's a big iceberg of zero trust in the world. And what you can see publicly is really, really small, really small. It's quite coincidental that you use that metaphor because I just did a show earlier this week on the uh, dark web. And a great guy from a company called Cyberlytica, and they're really you know great at that stuff. And he, he had a big iceberg. And uh, what was stunning to me uh, was uh, the tip of the iceberg was uh, what is indexed, you know, by the search engines, things like right. that. O only four percent, four percent of total content. Then you have like the deep web, you know, which is paywalls and you know email systems, you know, stuff like that. Um, and then you have, you know, the dark web where, where every all the uh, the bad things uh, seem to happen. So, uh, so it's interesting that that's a similar enough uh, metaphor. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, so our business is pretty clunky, right? I mean, we still do things the way we did last century in a lot of ways. So it's hard to get people to want to innovate. That's been the struggle. That's why it's taken eleven years, right? Uh, and uh, uh, so, you know, we need more innovation in cybersecurity. We, you know, we don't we don't write apps the same way we did back in the '90s. When was the last time you know there was a demand for Fortran programmers and COBOL programmers? <laughs> right? I mean, there are, but it's short term demand. There's COBOL cowboys. You should do a show with the COBOL cowboys. Well, that certainly sounds like a, a superhero to yeah. me. Yeah, there are, there, are, there, are, there are a bunch of dudes 
dudes and dudettes, I guess, out in, I think their headquarters are in Wiley, Texas, someplace like that. And uh, they just pop up on the radar, you know, a few times a year, get paid a lot of money to go fix COBOL programming problems in legacy systems and then go wow. back into semi-retirement. Yeah. Did you see that IBM actually just ported the uh, COBOL <laughs> compiler over to Linux recently? I, I did not, no. Uh, that, that was, uh, I guess it's coming back with a with a swing. <laughs> well, they... That'd be kind of interesting. But uh, Gary, I don't wonder if I could ask John a question. I wonder if that's okay if I can just uh, interject. So when it comes to obviously zero trust, I think there's still a lot of uh, ambiguity when it comes to zero trust. I think, you know, that... Uh, from an industry perspective, and even for me as a communicator and a cyber communicator, I, I still find that it's difficult to project and really get people to understand what it means. I think, you know, we still have a lot of work to do to demystify. And I, what are your thoughts on how we're going to go and get people to really understand the whole, you know, it's about verification. Uh, I don't, you know, to say that we don't trust anything, I think it's also, you know, we verify everything because we don't have to trust it because we verified it. And, you know, and as it comes to the opposed, like the identity piece, you know, you hear this a lot in zero trust. It's really about the identity. And well, that's know, not true. Right. I'm going to say two words to you. That's going to prove that that's not true. Snowden Manning. I've just proven to you that identity doesn't solve the problem. No, they were trusted users on trusted devices. They had the right antivirus, the right anti, uh, you know, the, 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 the right uh, patch levels or whatever. They had robust identity systems. They had powerful multi-factor authentication, but no one looked at their packets post auth to see what they were doing. So if you looked at the traffic stream, if you were, had been wise enough, you would see an asserted identity because an identity is always an assertion coming from a computer logged in by this identity called Snowden was doing this. But no one was asking the question, should that be computer be doing that? So that is the big thing that the identity providers have spun because all they have to offer is identity and really multi-factor authentication, which is really two-factor authentication with a different name. So it's nothing different than we've been doing for a long time. And it's important, don't get me wrong, but it is not equivalent to zero trust. Zero trust consumes identity information in policy. So if you look at the four design principles of zero trust, Focus on the business outcomes. What is the business trying to achieve? If you don't know that answer, you are going to fail in cybersecurity. Second thing, we design from the inside out. We start with the data or assets we're going to protect. That's called the protect surface. So I'm inverting the concept of ex attack surface to something that's very small and easily known called an attack, uh, a protect surface. So start at the protect surface and design outward instead of starting at the edge and design inward, which is what we've been told we're supposed to do and it never worked. And then the third thing we do is control access on a need to know basis, least privilege, need to know. Uh, and then we, we inspect and log all traffic so we can deploy a layer seven policy in place against that traffic. So ultimately zero trust is a layer seven policy statement. We need layer seven controls and we need identity information and we need context from inspection in order to do all of those things. And that's what zero trust really is. And there shouldn't have been confusion, except that a lot of my stuff was in that, what did you call it? Deep web uh, behind a paywall. And so people would write books on zero trust, but they would never either even ask for the original reports, yeah. let alone go and pay the money to get the original reports. So there's all this wow. stuff written about it, but and they would never ask me, right? So they would never go and do primary research, which when I was an analyst at Forrester, that's what I learned to do. In fact, the first thing I ever wrote was called the five myths of wireless security. I was at a reseller then, and it was for the, for the ISC Squared magazine. And so I went to the people who actually created the 802.11 spec and got insight into uh, what was right and what was wrong. So things like turn off your SSID, completely useless. Do MAC address co filtering, completely useless, right? Yeah. But it's still, even today, my, my iPhone and, uh, tells me that my wireless uh, network is, is uh, poorly secured because I haven't turned off broadcast SSID. Well, guess what? The SSID is always going off uh, and, and in the packet, in the air, whether I've turned it off or not. So, yeah. No way. Wait yeah, a minute. It, is it that is. true? It is very yeah. true. Yep, in the handshake, it goes yeah. out <laughs> all the time. It's always it's always beaconing. I always say wireless access points are really lonely. Come on, everybody, talk to me. Here I yep. am. Hey, hey, yep. here I am. Yep. Come and talk to me. 
Yeah. So basically, I have like a good friend, a mutual friend that we both have, uh, Dennis Totoro. You know, he always tells, uh, he, he really preaches the whole, you know, ingest everything, you know, F caps through layer two to seven, you know, ingest everything so that you can make intelligent decisions because you actually have the data to make those decisions. Wow. That, I mean, that's you're incredible. still stunned by the SSID isn't turned off. <laughs> oh, no, I mean, you don't understand. Well, no, there's a reason. I mean, you know, some of the audience knows my particular story, but there were actually 19 attack factors. You know, I was the CEO of a marketing company that was hacked uh, in an APT fashion by a criminal syndicate. I lost several million dollars, unable to receive justice. I pivoted to become an advocate. You know, that's kind of my origin story. And so we were early victims of Bluetooth hacks, of uh, Thunderbolt vulnerabilities, of uh, 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 my Wi-Fi was, uh, quote, provisioned by AT&T, but it wasn't. It was a spoof Wi-Fi, you know, that I was logging into through a pineapple and all this crazy stuff. You know, so like the only reason I know SSID, because my audience knows I don't, I don't even know what I'm talking about. You know, I know a little bit about many, many things, which is why I have you guys, you know, you know yeah. everything. So, you know, um, but no, no, that really it resonates at home because I fought that friggin' battle, you know, uh, in many different well, ways. Well, there's just a lot but, of things that people say in the world for their own reasons, right? I mean, I don't know why this whole turn off SSID I mean, it, it stops good people from accidentally doing bad things. Right. But our job is to stop bad people from doing intentionally bad things. Yeah. Right. right. And that's, that's a whole different game. And so a lot of the things that you do give you a sense of complacency. Yeah, I'm stop I could never break that. So it must be unbreakable. No, the people that you're fighting against have PhDs in, in computer science and can think so far ahead of all of us. Oh, that, yeah. you know, leave yeah. us in the dust. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, you said a couple yeah. things that also re resonate. Coincidentally, uh, by the way, uh, for, in my work, those people that you know kind of know me or the show, uh, my north star to try to get through all this craziness over all these years was Einstein, who I know is a hero of our audience and should be for everyone. And one day, you know, a reporter asked him. He said, "Mr. Einstein, on one hand, you have science and physics and mathematics and all that, and on the other hand, you have you know people who believe in the possible existence of a higher authority or God. You know, how do you sort of recognize?" reconcile those two things. And he said, coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. So I'm going to invoke an Einstein moment because I interviewed Edward Snowden's boss on this show. He was recently retired from the NSA uh, and he ran East Asia. I mean, talk about head exploding. And, and we mm -hmm. talked about Snowden and what was that like? It was unbelievable, you know, which sort of takes me to this like human element aspect of all this. You know, what, what are people supposed to do or think about like regarding zero trust? Well, people. So I'm often accused of saying that, that zero trust is saying that people aren't trustworthy. And I'm not saying that. Right. I'm saying that people aren't packets. So what we're trying to do is control packets. Oh. And so if we, you know, identity, identity is always an assertion. It's not real. Right. Gary is asserted to be generating packets from his device right now. Uh, but it's not real Gary. Gary is wherever Gary is right right now. So unless Gary's in the singularity. Uh, and then uh, uh, and then the second thing is it's always fungible. You know, you can spoof identities. But the other thing that you can do is you can use old school um, uh, uh, sp trade craft, spy trade trade craft. They can say, Gary, you know, you did this bad thing. And unless you uh, give me this intellectual property from your company, I'm going to tell somebody that you did this bad thing. Right. right? Yeah, right? Yeah, I can threaten all, you. Yeah. 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 Right? Or I can pay you money. Right. Hey, Gary, I know that you've got that loan to uh, to Tony Soprano. And he's about to come and break <laughs> your, your legs. Yeah. So how about I pay off that loan for you, and in return, you give me this uh, data that I want, right? So wow. it's always it's always fungible, and then yeah. it has entropy. Identity has entropy. As you know, we we tend to log on once, and then well, yeah, we're fine, everything's good. But no, that there's entropy in the system, and so when you when you talk to the people who really understand identity, like Eve Mailer, the CTO of Forgerock, another. Uh, former Forrester colleague, I talk to her all the time. And when I have identity questions, I go to the source. I don't just make stuff up. I just go, I go to Eve or I talk to Heather Dahl at Identico or I talk to whoever and say, give me, help me understand passwordless. Help me understand sovereign identity. Help me understand 
uh, biometrics and what the value is of biometrics, right? Which Eve has a great saying uh, that biometrics make a better username than a password, right? They should be replacing usernames because we can all figure out usernames. So, but we can't like, hey, Gary, guess what? Your 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 thumbprint was uh, compromised in a, right. in a data breach. Right. So we're going to give you a new thumbprint. Um, you probably can use that thumb in about three to six months again, right? I mean, you know, th these things don't work, right? And then there's unintended consequences. Mercedes right. Benz comes out and says, well, people are stealing cars in Germany. So we're going to put a thumbprint reader and you can't turn on the car without a thumbprint. So what do the what do the car thieves do? They hack off dudes' thumbs, right? So now it didn't work because it needed proof of life. You had to have blood flowing through it. But still, there's a bunch of guys out there going, "Hey, how you doing, Gary?" Oh my god! Right? <laughs> so it's uh, you know okay, they, they, you, they you literally you literally had said the most unusual thing that I've heard in 81 interviews. <laughs> oh wow, good. Yep. Yeah. You know, yeah. Speaking of which, uh, I'd like to get a scoop. Right, I've never had a scoop. Okay. Um, so you're going to be the first, uh, I think. So given your unique perch, you know, as the, the creator of, of this, what is now ubiquitous way of thinking about cybersecurity is zero trust. How do you feel seeing like the whole industry is kind of, uh, I don't I, I don't know the right words, you know, uh, globbed on you, took your concepts, you know, asked what, like what, tell me that, how do you feel about being oh, man, sort of it's, the, it's, the father of all this. You know, it's incredibly gratifying and humbling at the same time because I never thought it would take off. I mean, I spent years with people actually telling me I was crazy. You are insane. That's not the way we've always done things. We're never going to do it that way. Some of those same people lead zero trust teams now. So that's one thing. And then at the same time, it's frustrating to see how they've spun it mostly for product you know, based upon the limitations of their products, right? So I can understand misunderstanding it, but but spinning it so far uh, and, and clearly not even understanding the basic concepts. Like, so I'll read something. You know, we're, we're going to use zero trust to make this system trustworthy. No, you're not, because zero trust takes trust out of the system. That's how you know somebody is a charlatan in this game, is they tell you that zero trust will make something trustworthy. And so that they've misunderstood the whole concept, right? Trust is always bad in cybersecurity, in digital systems, always. It's a four-letter word. There's never a time that it's good. In, in, even in human uh, interactions, it's really hard to deal with because, you know, it, the, the opposite of trust is betrayal, right? It, wow. But trust is binary. You cannot measure trust. So you're either trusted. And once I say, well, I don't trust Ron that much. Well, then he becomes untrusted. I can't, I, I can't measure that. So I, I often use the word confidence, like confidence. I can have more or less confidence in a system, but trust I can't. So the, you know, it's binary. The opposite is betrayal and everybody's been betrayed by a close friend. Everybody in the world has been betrayed by somebody. Right. And so um, that's why it doesn't work. And whoever used that word back in 1984, uh, Ken Thompson, who co-created Unix, uh, won the Turing Award. And in his Turing Award speech, it was called The Problem with Trusting Trust. And essentially what he was saying, which is a very similar thing to what I've been saying, and I didn't know about it until long after I'd done that, but um, uh, Ben Rothke told me about it. But he said, I can't trust any code that I haven't written myself. Wow. Uh, well, that was his thesis. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, you're not going to be able to trust any code because Ken Thompson isn't going to write all the code in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it's just a really interesting thing how we use language. There's a book called Plastic Words about how we take words and we just throw them around like candy, right? And so yeah. they become useless and meaningless, but we use them to justify things all the time. So yeah. that's kind of the frustration of it. But I'm working hard to kind of return return back to the the original concepts because the original concepts work with everybody work with all vendors it's a very very happy fun sandbox the zero trust sandbox you can bring your toys in and play and there's a place for you on our playground but don't tell me that that we can only play kickball in 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 zero, the zero trust sandbox no we can play tetherball and we can we can play jacks or tiddlywinks or whatever we want bring all your toys in because there's probably a place for them. Wow. I mean, that's a really cool metaphor. I, you know, and it's interesting uh, when you talk about the concept of zero trust um, and, and just uh, human beings as well. But, 
You know, I've been working for uh, over four years now, essentially, you know, donating uh, everything um, to earn uh, some trust in an industry that calls itself zero trust. And you can't get any less trustworthy than zero unless you go into negative numbers, unless I'm missing something, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's just the, but but as a person, so as a person we're trust, uh, I think Malcolm Gladwell calls it trust engines or something like that in his new book or not in his newest book, but the one before that. Uh, Maybe, maybe, but it was a similar thing. We were at, as human beings, we're designed to trust, right? right? And then we're always like, I don't know, but there's no way to live life without doing that at the human level, right? I mean, what am I going to do? An entire background check on Gary Berman before I do a podcast? It it actually doesn't matter, right? And so uh, you, you, you just go, yeah, sure, I'll do the podcast with Gary because. A, I have a message that get, wants to get out. B, he wants to tell that message. So that's the synergy right there. And well, hold on. I have to give, wait, wait, forgive the interruption. I, ha- I have to just give you a quick insight into that. Um, you know, because of a series of coincidences, I, you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, my, my custom, you know, right. Here. Right. And you'll notice that the top part of this is green. And, you know, my, my actual mask is, is green like this as well. Uh-huh. And how that came about um, was because uh, my sidekick and I were hired by a Deloitte Consulting to go to the United Arab you, Emirates. Your, your uh, sidekick or psychic? I didn't. Side, that, sidekick. Right? Yeah, sidekick. Sidekick. Oh, I thought you said psychic. I'm sorry. Uh, remember, I'm going <laughs> to do, com- okay. do the comedy. Okay, you focus on the substance. Okay. Um, no, good try though. Um, anyway, so the we were hired to go to the United Arab Emirates and they wanted me to create a costume that matched the color of their flag. So as it happens, it's green, black, and red. So I made it green. Well, behind me, this happens to be a real thing. It's, it's uh, something we use for trade shows, but most people use green screen. So I'll show at the, uh, maybe some other time or put it on our site or whatever, but I actually am transparent because you can literally see right through me. So John, there's no due diligence. You can see right through me. There you go. No. There you go. So, like so speak. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I really like one thing that you said there too, uh, John, when it comes to, you know, really how things are being, pre- you know, perpetuated through the industry with, you know, almost like words, you know, people get behind these words and they actually don't understand the meaning of them and they get kind of regurgitating and say, oh, you have to use a zero trust model. You have to do this. You have to create this. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, people, and we see that through all industries. It's not just our industry. We see that everywhere where people start, you know, talking, and they're not really helping the situation because it just, again, makes it very ambiguous, very mystified. And of course, and, and even worse, incorrect. You know, right. <laughs> you, want, you want to get this right as best we can. We can't stop everything. We can't, you know, one thing that I've always struggled with is, you know, something like an account takeover. And because we know bad actors are so good now of going through and actually uh, developing a persona based off of like, if I take over your account, you know, I'm going to go through your sent items and I'm going to find out, oh, you're, ex- you know, somebody, you said you're going to send this, this document to somebody next week. Well, that's a perfect opportunity for you to leverage trust uh, in a bad way because they are mm-hmm. expecting a document next week. And you're going to, of course, as, as the bad actor, are going to give that to them. You're going to give them a document with malware in it next week because you've taken over that account. And I can, you know, Again, back to the whole zero trust, you're looking for something that is the behavior isn't there. It isn't correct. And I think there's a lot there to do and to educate people on. And of course, you would know best about how to do that. Like, how do you even get in there and stop that situation or even get eyes on it? Well, that's where the technology comes in place, because there's a mail gateway. That mail gateway is going to send that email out through the public Internet to another mail gateway. Right. And in between there there's technology that we can use um, to solve this problem, right? So that that file, all those files should be inspected through a sandbox. So mm-hmm. you can explode it in a sandbox and see if it, it's, it's malware. And I would think, you know, I know at Palo Alto Networks, our sandbox had over 99.9% accuracy. So wow. yeah, if something slipped through, it was very, very unlikely. And so you want to leverage the technology. So a lot of people you know, want to say, well, we need to teach people to do things differently, but the technology is, is there, 
right? And it's just a lot of people won't deploy it. And oftentimes because they think it's too costly, but it's never as costly as the consequences of a data breach. But if you think about real life, let's go back to real life. If you went and got a coffee today, let's just pretend that you did. I don't know if you did or not, but you went to Starbucks. So when you went into Starbucks, did you walk around the entire building to see how it was made? Did, you know, are these pillar supports, uh, properly in the ground and, uh, uh, you know, the deep enough and what kind of bolts are they using? What kind of metal on those bolts? Is that the proper hardness according to the Honeywell uh, hardness scale? You know, how did they install the door? Do I think yeah. that the, the ceiling is going to fall down? You did none of those things, right? Not, so, not even one. Not even one. <laughs> not even and, one. And so that, you know, that's, structural engineering and that's really what we need to do in our companies but we can't but the business can't say you know those hardened steel bolts are more expensive than the soft steel bolts we can get away with the soft steel bolts they're fit for purpose my favorite term fit for purpose no they're not right so we can design these systems where for the most part the people can use the systems without knowing they're involved in the system and they don't have to interact with the system because I can't tell whether I've got a phishing email. I don't have the brain power to do all the computations, unpack the link, understand where it might go, all those kinds of things. That's, a te- that's what computers are great at. But I see a lot of people who don't have that anti-phishing technology, for example, uh, and then they wonder why they get fished and then they blame the victim. And I don't like victim blaming, you know, Hey, you know, Ron, we've taught you for 20 years to click on links, these little blue uh, links. Right. And sometimes ask yourself why they're blue. There's an interesting story behind there. So we teach you to click on that. And so you've clicked on a million good links, but you just now clicked on one bad link. So it's your fault that, that we got hacked. I mean, you saw this with solar winds there and, and, and fire eye. They're blaming low level people. And that's not right. I mean, you saw that at Equifax. Some guy wouldn't patch a system. No, somebody was told not to patch that system because if the if it's a bad patch, we might be down for an hour and we can calculate the cost of being down for an hour. But we cannot calculate in modern risk uh, theory is what happens if the worst case scenario happens, that's beyond what we can think about. Because no one could think that that Equifax was going to lose 400 million records and the CEO was going to have to testify in front of Congress and then get fired. That was not on the risk committee's list of risks that they had to to mitigate. But it happened. Same with the Sony Mm -hmm. PlayStation network. Oh, the network could never go down for six weeks, so we won't patch uh, uh, the Apache server. No, it went down for six weeks. Right. And the CEO ultimately of Sony got fired. So the consequences are more extreme than we can ever calculate. And and and, and we need to realize that that this is a whole different game than the than the human world. So quit anthropomorphizing, um, you know, digital systems. Wow. I mean, that that is so interesting. Um, I would like to ask, why are links blue? Uh What's his name? Gerald. Yeah. I would have to research the exact because I, I, I went to a seminar with Gene Kim once uh, who wrote Phoenix Project. We went to a, 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 a seminar on user experience design. Gerald Sproul, I think, is his name. Um, great UX guy. I mean, I follow him on Twitter and he was doing a whole thing on like why people don't don't interact with your website, but he had a whole thing on why links were blue. So I I think that that's probably, I I don't remember the whole story, but it relates to the early days of the internet and, and how color palettes worked and how somebody just decided they should be blue. And now links are all blue. Right. So they should all be red, Uh, you know, they should be red, (laughs) like a warning. Who knows? That's actually a smart way to do it. Especially if, you know, if you get some sort of automation detection in there that says this link is there's something that we're not quite sure about it. So actually change the color to say, wow, be careful. And of course we have the tools that can do that. Now, maybe you should just block the email altogether and say, but you know, there's going to be times where it's going to be like, let's say a 50 or 60% match and say, yeah, it's, uh, it's got, it's got us concerned. So let's actually showcase that that link has us concerned. 
That's a great idea, Ron. Yeah, we have a, a lot of comments from the audience. Um, I, I'm just going to uh, pop in a few uh, just so you can uh, offer your your uh, point of view on on what you're seeing here, John. And wow, yeah. this is just great. Yeah, I mean, OAuth, I've been talking with Eve Mailer about OAuth forever. I mean, here's cybersecurity. We're still struggling to ingest SAML assertions. And there's all these other higher level identity concepts that we haven't we haven't even begun to to talk about, you know. So yeah. Um, and then uh, here's here's another one. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Wh wh why is that funny? <laughs> I mean, come on. Uh, man. Well, I'm yeah. assuming that he's that he's talking about Palo Alto Networks is the pan. That's what I'm yeah. I'm guessing his joke is. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, fair enough. Pan OS. Um, Yep, yep. Um, so we're, we're uh, seeing a few others uh, here. This is, uh, I think, interesting. Dennis DeToro. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you need a lot of, I mean, if you just have one attribute, right, it's pretty hard to validate identity. You need lots of attributes. You know, they're, they're tying into the LDAP which is almost always Active Directory, right? And then uh, uh, some behavioral attributes, some multi-factor attributes, uh, and then a whole bunch of provisioning on the back end of that system that says John is allowed to go to this resource. Wow, that's interesting. And uh, this is an interesting insight uh, that we're hearing. Uh, they track you when you're working incognito. I mean, that's not what a regular consumer thinks. Oh, this will have your IP. Yeah, the, well, there's a new uh, there's a new browser plugin from uh, DuckDuckGo Duck, Duck, for yeah. Google to try to stop that. And yeah. a lot of people are switching over to DuckDuckGo. They have their own browser or to Firefox or something else. I mean, privacy is the big issue of the day, right? But you you can have security without privacy, but you cannot have privacy without security because security are the mechanisms used to uh, control privacy attributes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's super interesting. Um, well, you know, we could just go on forever. You know, I, I said earlier, I have a man crush on you, uh, only because of the comic, but now it's because of your substance too. So, I mean, John, what a, what an absolute privilege, uh, you know, to have you, you know, on the show, you know, thank you for, for being uh, the real life uh, unsung cyber heroes that we're dedicated to, you know, and um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your new company? I, I think that that would be interesting. Like uh, you just switched. Yeah, I, I spent four years at Palo Alto Networks as a, the field CTO talking about zero trust and helping people understand how to build those environments. And so I left uh, uh, about a month ago and went over to a company called Ontoit, a Dutch uh, Palo Alto Networks partner. This is actually the first a uh, piece of swag ever with Zero Trust written on it. This was the hat from an Ontoit uh, Zero Trust conference I did, uh, oh, 2013, 2014, when I was how, still working How do you spell Ontoit? How, how do you spell that for our audience? Just because, you, you know, you said it. O-N, the number two, I-T. So okay, cool. Ontoit.net, yeah, not yeah. .com, .net. And okay, so, cool. yeah, so I, so they have a zero trust managed service. I've been, I've known those guys, been working with them, got introduced to them by uh, executives at Palo Alto Networks when I was working at Forrester and have continued to work with them. And, and so their team just has done some incredible things. I mean, they have probably built more zero trust environments in the world than any other company. So the natural wow, evolution wow. of zero trust is to deliver it as a managed service. And that's why I came over to onto it uh, uh, February fifteenth, the Ides of March. Yeah. So. And you know, the impression I'm getting is you're having fun. Is that is that fair? Do you have fun at your work? Oh, I always have fun at my work. I mean, I was a network engineer first, and 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 once I got into security, security is the most fun part of IT, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're not having fun in security, you're not doing it right because a it's really interesting. It's adversarial, right? There's no other part of a business that's adversarial other than cybersecurity. Uh, or, you know, you're, you're always protecting against an adversary. And that adversary might be a nation state. It might, you know, you might actually be fighting a war. And so, so those things are fun. And you're making the world uh, a little bit better each and every day, just a little bit by doing your job. Just you can have, you can feel good about what you did at the end of the day. I mean, cybersecurity is a moral imperative in the modern world. It's not just a nice to have. It's not just overhead, which a lot of business leaders look at 
cybersecurity is the department of no. They just tell us no all the time, right? And and they spend money and we don't know what they're doing with it and all that kind of stuff. It is a moral imperative because in a data breach, behind every data point, you know, I'll hear people say, oh, that was only 4 million records. Well, that's 4 million people whose yeah. lives were disrupted. Maybe only a little bit, but that's 4 million people, just like you talked about with, with what happened to you, right? Yep. To the to the attacker, you were just data, right? No one cared about Gary, but it disrupted your life. And so we're helping individual people because we can yeah. assign each of those credit card numbers to a human being who at the very least has to get a call from the credit card company and saying, hey, you can't use that credit card anymore. We're going to send you a new one. And so there's a minor inconvenience there. But, uh, but, but what we're doing is good. It's moral. It's right. It's righteous. Yes, it is. Yeah. Amen to that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I, I could yeah. not have sent it better really. Bravo yeah. from, yeah. uh, from everyone. Well, you know, uh, Ron, do you want to have a last word here? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to really, uh, you know, appreciate, I'm appreciative of everything that you've done, John, and that you continue to do. And, you know, obviously I'm going to take a look at, uh, <laughs> where you're working now and, uh, you know, maybe we can touch base and see, uh, you know, maybe I can help do some promotions or who knows, but I'm, I'm, I'm right. definitely appreciative of, you know, what you've done, what you've built and how you really have evolved, you know, and getting the message out. I think that's really the key is, you know, and I think that there's some takeaways here, even from my perspective, being in the communication world is that we really need to start understanding of what we're communicating and going to the source, you know, instead of just, I mean, look at the whole misinformation uh, whether that's deep fake or everything, we're we're in a basically a, a, a almost a pandemic of its own when it comes to misinformation in the world now. And I think you know we're not helping matters any when we're just saying, okay, well, there's a post that's gone viral. It's talking about zero trust. It's not actually correct, but we're continuing to spread that around. And I think that right. we have to start being more. We have to verify. We it's kind of funny. We talk about zero trust. We talk about verification. Yet we're not oh, doing it ourselves in this industry and in the marketing and everything like that to say well, we should really verify our sources as well. And let's make sure that we're actually helping get the message, the right message to the to the people. And because otherwise it doesn't matter. We're actually doing more harm than good. Right, right. No, indeed. Um, you know, on that note, uh, on behalf of a grateful digital universe, you know, thanks John and Ron and all of you out there in the audience who do this uh, every day. If uh, you want to be a guest uh, on our show, uh, just uh, send uh, an email to Gary at cyberheroescomics.com. And, you know, we're always looking for a cool, uh, interesting uh, people. And, uh, man, are we in the right uh, industry for that? So, you know, thank you so much for, uh, you know, being interested and uh, for watching our show. And, um, uh, you know, we have something uh, for you, John, that uh, is uh, really very uh, unusual. You're, you're going to be one of the uh, first uh, recipients of uh, our new membership club, oh, the Cyber Hero nice. Adventures Network. <laughs> yeah, oh, wow. is, he, is he a bold drone? What is that? <laughs> look, look, look we, we, put your, we put the cartoon in there. You know, there you go. From, yeah. from uh, Chase. And so you're a, you're a certified unsung cyber hero and defender of the digital universe. Well, you'll be happy to know that's the only uh, active certification I have right now. So all my others have expired. <laughs> Perfect. Well, you need to get out more. I mean, I, I, <laughs> if I were you, I, I would get a very inexpensive frame. Uh, that's all I'm saying. But, oh, okay. you know, okay. I, I hope it brings you, you know, a little bit of joy just as. Thank as, you. Thank uh, you. Well, you, you certainly brightened up, you know, uh, uh, my day and I, our audience. And again, you know, uh, thank you for uh, who you are and why you do what you do and how you go about it. We really appreciate it. Yeah. So uh, on that note, everyone out there, uh, stay safe and have a great day. Hey, everybody.